All right, it is 7 p.m. Central Standard Time here where I live. It's been very hot this week. And we've got a couple more days of these 86 degree days that turn out to feel like they're 97. And then we turn off and we go to a bunch of days where it doesn't even get above 77. So I'm so ready for, uh, you know, just having better weather and stuff like that. So welcome everybody tonight. We're going to be talking about ceremony magic and the golden dawn. And the aspect that I want to deal with it is, is for once I'm going to make a couple things known first. One, I'm no expert. I'm not regarding, I'm not any of these people before me that kind of brought everything out. So on that side, you know, it's just, I've been, this is something that I've gone through Oh my God, since I was in my 20s, I've never been with a, a lodge. Uh, here where I live, finding any kind of ceremonial lodges is kind of hard. You have to go to the larger city centers like Oklahoma City, St. Louis, um, places like that. And it's just like I, if not with COVID and everything, I just wouldn't have the wherefall to travel, you know, so many times a year to do things with the lodges and stuff like that. So everything that I'm doing, is stuff that uh, that either I've done with other people that we weren't ever working as a quote unquote lodge, and also the idea that um, what we're going to be talking about tonight, and eventually I'm going to do other things with this as well. Um, we're talking about we're going to talk about this in the idea of as a beginner, because you see so many videos and you see so many things where they're where they're showing all this stuff. And then you have people that are completely brand new to the, even the idea of what ceremonial magic is, which we're going to talk about that. Um, but they don't know where to start. They see all this stuff and then, you know, they do little bits and pieces and they don't get as far as these people that have the resources and things are. So this discussion is going to be on the, on the ideas of everyday people can have access to what this is. It's not just something that are for those that have, you know, the money to set up a lodge and do all these things. This is for everybody. But before we do that, being summer and me being pagan, I'm going to open a bottle of mead. So if you have a favorite beverage, go ahead and get that and get going as we get this started. This is homemade. It took me 10 weeks to make. It is red raspberry and it's beautiful. Here in a couple of days, I got a friend of mine who went to a charity auction and he uh, won a collection of Old Forester whiskey. Every type of Old Forester whiskey he won. He won one of each of those types all the years. And the one that he said that they say is the worst, but it's still good, is the Old Forester Black Label. So he's going to be coming here in the next couple of days and bringing me that. So not only do I have this mead, but I'm going to have some nice bourbon. Good to have Sean here. He's been with me in, in other broadcasts before. And if everything goes right, possibly here within the next little bit, I've, I asked him a while back if he'd like to do an interview, which we might see about if we can get that going on. Okay. All right. Cheers. Oh, man, that is beautiful. So putting aside everything that I've just said is saying that, you know, I don't claim to be any kind of guru in this or any expert. What I do know, and I will give some, I do have some, some controversial opinions about certain things. And I will bring those up too, because it will, uh, it will, it will, it, will, it will explain some of the ideas that I have and some of the areas that I would like to see modern 
uh, not just Golden Dawn style, but any practicum of Golden Dawn magic or ceremonial magic go. And one of the things I'll just put that right out right here now, just to kind of get it going is the idea that a lot of the practices that come uh, into ceremonial magic, Western ceremonial magic, and the lodge styles of, of, of the practices such as Golden Dawn, OTO, Bota, all of this stuff. There are a hundred million different ways, but one thing that, that kind of ties it all together is kind of like a common thread is this even one of one of the uh you know the practices that go with it which we will talk about uh some of the things that are tied is the the cabalistic in, intentions and things like that uh you know working the tree of life and such um being a pagan that's one of my main influences in life is the idea that uh, you know, I tend to work with the more earth magic side of things. I'm a druid, I'm a witch. I have all these things that are tied into these more personal, get your hands dirty kind of magical things. And when you look at Kabbalah, you're looking at a Judaic practice that was, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, you know, with the, with the Jewish people and stuff like that. And the one thing that my mind can't really, uh, uh, what do you call it, kind of grasp into is the idea of um, the Judaic aspects because of the idea of that tying into a monotheistic deity when you tend to be a pantheist, looking at the broader spectrum of not just a one, you know, solid thing, you have the pantheon, which is more spread out. You're looking at more of a familial thing because that's how we live on this planet. We are familial, tribal, human, humanocentric people, okay? And when I look at the ideas of, I, I mean, because of the thing is like, before I continue on with this, you kind of have to look at the ideas of what ceremonial magic versus earth magic, okay? Earth magic is purposed to deal with our, lives as they are now how we deal with things from day to day whether it's our health it's whether it's our circumstances in the world and stuff that's why we have healing salves and we have spells for prosperity and all these different things because that's what we're working with we're working with kitchen table magic ceremonial magic in all its forms whether it's you know golden dawn or whatever tradition is you're kind of looking at not just the kind of, you're not looking at the magic where you're getting your hands dirty per se. It's the idea that it's a spiritualized form of looking, connecting yourself to everything else. It's not an idea of what you're doing here. It's like, I call it pre preparatory magic because of the fact for those of us that are believers in you know past lives, um, moving through, uh, I'm one of those believers that as you go through your many incarnations, eventually you're going to stop. And when you do stop, the reason why is because you've reached perfection. You have nothing. The universe says you've got it. You've learned everything that you need to learn. So here you are. You're, you're one of us now. You're completely stuck. You're going to be this way forever because you've gone through all of this stuff in, in, you know, from the beginning of your essence till now. It's called becoming part of the all, becoming part of the one. And that's, you know, that's something that I would hope, regardless of the fact that I'm pagan, that I have these, you know, the ideas of the gods and such, you know, even going beyond that, you're looking at the broader universal thing. And that's what ceremonial magic, in a lot of its intent, uh, tries to, you know, tries to convey. Another thing is uh, a lot of people, there are younger people that don't know the, uh, the proximity of how ceremonial magic came around. Uh, looking at the Kabbalah, like I was saying just a minute ago, being a Jewish construct, you have to go all the way back to the biblical uh, eras where the example of Solomon, King Solomon was a great wizard. He was a magical person. 
he was one of those that consulted the witch at Endor um, and all these things. So when you look at that context in the Old Testament, way back in, in those times, if, if, you know, if that time can be codified, you'd see that, you know, right in the midst of all of that, you had the two thorns and uh, you, well, actually you had three thorns, actually. You had the idea that Solomon was a ceremonial magician, that he consulted the witch of Endor, which is supposed to be against the commandments and against God. And then also just looking at the way that the books were written, and it says, you know, I, I can't remember the exact verse, so forgive me, I don't have a Bible to quote or anything. But there was always that adage of thou shalt not, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. So all the way back in, in those times, um, you, you know, you had the foundations for what ceremonial magic was and is going to be. So it's, and you know, the other thing is like, it kind of goes against the, the, the biblical thing in itself is because here you have King Solomon and you have everything that's come up in the earlier books of the Bible and all this stuff in the Christian God, supposedly being jealous, there's always wars and famines and all these different things. And to me, there's just something that seems a little bit out of, out of bound or out of the ordinary with it. Because if, if God, if the Christian God was so much against these things, why did he let Solomon come to power in the way he did? You know, he let, he let somebody that did the things that Solomon did, he allowed him to, you know, take part in this stuff. And so that was just like another thing that, you know, some people say that, you know, if you're a Christian, you can't do ceremonial magic. Yes, you can. It's, I mean, you know, Kabbalah might be uh, a little, the Kabbalistic parts, let's put it that way, might be a little bit against there's certain things that might be against what Christian doctrine. Well, it's all against all Christian doctrine because really, if you're doing any kind of magic, you're going against the God, God, and everything. But you know, just looking at it the way that we would, as because you know, some people have asked the question, um, do you know, can can I do this? I I'm a druid. I'm part of Obad. I do this, that, and the other thing. And I go, then they ask, but can I practice ceremonial magic? Yes, you can, because of the fact that everything, I believe that any practice that enhances or uh, uh, makes something, it makes you a better person. And if it strengthens you as a person, use it. Don't be afraid to do it because somebody says that you're going to go to hell for doing that. I mean, being a pagan, being a Buddhist, being a Druid, uh, you know, being, you know, any of these things. You know, being a Seventh-day Adventist, the Christians think Seventh-day Adventists are going to hell. So you have all these different things. So regardless of what people think, you know, you have the ability to do this as a spiritual situation. So, all right. And then you have, you, you know, you have all of that in the background. Then we're going to start moving into talking about the ways that ceremonial magic started to come about one of the things that i think you know the, the the renaissance of ceremonial magic was in the early centuries 1100s 1200s 1300s and you had these people that were coming together um you had the influence of the church you had these things but then in the background you had all of this stuff that was going on with people that didn't want to have to, you know, go, th go through all of the BS that they were seeing, even then going on with the churches and they go, well, how do we, how do we, you know, do this? How do we make ourselves, uh, how can we do spiritual things without having to be a part of that? Basically, that's how it came around. And people started getting together. I, I'm one of those people that believes that ceremonial magic and not because ceremonial magic and pagan magic kind of coincided there for a while. An example, 
a book which is on my bookshelf over here. Uh, High Magic Shade, written by Gerald Gardner, was one of the first books that he ever wrote in England back in the late 40s, uh, before 1950. And one of the things about that book is it's a story, which, you know, it's, it's a, actually a pretty cool story, even written from the way that he had written it. But if you look about it, look about it is this is one of the things that also as a pagan, yes, you can have these things uh, involved in your practice. As an example, the book High Magic Aid, it is not just a story, but it is a thinly veiled Gardnerian book of shadows. Okay. But also when you read the actual story and you go from the front to the back and you go through the whole thing, you notice that in some of his ritual descriptions, um, the way that he had helpers and for certain things that he was uh, involving uh, a ceremonial magic. Another example is in witchcraft traditions today, they invoke the watchtowers. The watchtowers are not primarily Wiccan. Watchtowers are a ceremonial construct. They always have been. The idea of and it harm none, do what thou wilt, was not a, uh, a you know a catchy phrase that Dorian Valiente came up with. It was earlier uh, come up with by Alistair, Alistair Crowley. Thelema, it's a thelemic. Uh, you know, it's 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 thelemic. That thing right there, the and it harm none, do what the will. Love is the law. Love under will. That whole thing. But I mean, it's nothing that says that you can't. Uh, follow those principles it just shows that even back then when we were starting to come into our more you know pagan movements within the world you know after Gardner started going on and then when Buckland brought it to the United States in 1963 and moving forward there's always been something that even pagan traditions witchcraft traditions have borrowed or incorporated into their um, practices such as the watchtowers and some other things um uh going back to my earlier point one of the things that i'm trying to do is i'm i'm still trying to work with certain things in in the cabalistic realm but i'm taking it i'm taking it in a different direction um i just can't as a druid also i just can't reconcile a lot of the stuff that goes with this so I'm working in two ways. One, there's a book that was written by um, John Michael Greer. It's called The Celtic Golden Dawn. Okay, and it's Golden Dawn for those that follow a Druidic path, specifically a Druidry and, Bard and the Bardic Path. That's all well and good. Um, I'm wanting to get that and kind of give it a go over and see how that goes. But also, there were... Uh, I, they, there are bits and pieces that can be researched, but um, yeah, it was, it was Yates. Yates in Ireland was part of the Golden Dawn, okay? And there was things that were going, and this is when things were going on in London with uh, Blavatsky and, uh, you know, uh, McGregor Mathers and all this stuff was going on. But the one thing also at this time, Yates was looking to work on his Celtic identity, okay? And he was looking at how can he work within the constructs of the Golden Dawn and have it be, uh, you know, tailored to working within the Celtic national mindset. You know, that's one of the things like he was he was seriously if you look at his writings. Um, I mean, God, I my two favorite writers are Yates and William Blake. So there you go. But it's just like there were things that he was doing. And I'm one of those people that because of the fact that I do have that little bit of a twinge with, you know, dealing with the monotheistic sides of um you know the, the Kabbalah part of things. And Kabbalah is just one part of it. Uh, we'll get into talking about some of the other practices, just as goetic stuff, uh, you know, just all these different things. And one thing tonight, we're not going to be talking about the specific actions and how to do those things. That's a whole another series of about 20 different episodes. 
but it is something to get you started. That's another thing. Tonight is for the people that don't know about these things. It's a way to get started for yourself, you know, figure it out how you want to do it and, and do it. So one of the things that I've got, and I don't have a giant library, but what I do have, and this is just some stuff that I'm going to uh, recommend that if you can get it, um, find it. One of the places, the best places that you can find some of this stuff is either on uh, eBay, eh, cringe, but still can be found, Amazon, uh, some of the more uh, well-known occult booksellers. But the first set of books, one thing, well, one of the main things that I love about the ideas of ceremonial magic is that one of the things that is always kind of centered within what uh, you can do with serial magic is the tarot. Tarot is one of the most important things that are tied to the Western ceremonial practices because this is a pictorial key of ceremonial magic. This picture right here, that's the magician and his weapons, his tools of the art. And whenever you look well, let me just find, there's one specific card that I need to find here. And uh, as an example on the, we have a page on Facebook, Golden Dawn Study Group. And in that study group, I've been recently going through the uh, Sephira of the Tree of Life. And we are currently up to the full Sephira. And one thing that you'll notice is for each of the Sephiroth, there is a corresponding uh, tarot card. Of course, uh, with Chesed being number four, it's the fours. Whenever you go to the top, the very first Sephiroth, it's the ones. Um, so you have the first one, two, three, you have the supernal triangle. So you've got ones, twos, threes, and then you've got some corresponding uh, face cards as well. Let me find probably the most ceremonial card. And you'll see what I mean here. And there are many decks out there. Um, one deck that I recommend that I'm going to be getting here pretty soon is the uh, Golden Dawn uh, uh, Tarot Ceremonial Magic. That one. And I also actually like the uh, deck from um, uh, the new deck from Juan Milo Duquette. And there's another deck that is, yeah, there you go, man smart. Is that the new, is that the new edition? Yeah, because that original edition, there's a green box that goes all the way back to the very first one that Lon ever released. And it was many years ago. And there are places that that Pacific deck is selling for 1500 bucks. The new one that just released a month ago, three and a half weeks ago, because he's got a, actually it came out, whatever. At the most, it's going to be like 40 bucks, I think, or close to it. And I don't know how much the book is. You have the book, usually you have to get the book separately. And I think the book is, uh, I don't know, like 35 or something like that. Where you at, buddy? Pardon me, it's 78 cards. And the, there it is. That's the one right there. This deck right here, this card right here. There it is. Yep, that's the book. This is the uh, tarot card, the High Priestess. And if you notice, you'll see on uh, each side, you have a black pillar with the letter B on it, and you have a white pillar with the letter J. And what these are, these are, and then you have the high priestess in the middle. So you have the three pillars of the uh, Kabbalistic Sephiroth. You have the pillar on the left is the uh, pillar of severity. Then you have the middle, middle pillar. And then the white pillar is the pillar of mercy. Why? Because 
Chesed the fourth. Uh, Sephiroth is the Sephiroth of Mercy. And this deck right here is not going to be as much as what uh, Sean's is, but Sean's has a, that's a beautiful deck. I would take very good care of that because that's something that you want to have for many. And that as well. Yes, sir. Um, but this deck right here runs about 11 bucks. Sometimes if you get it on sale at your local occult store, they, I've had seen them as, as cheap as seven, uh, uh, seven or eight bucks. Also, if you want to have fun, you can get the ones that are like five times this size. They're like 10 by 12 or whatever. Those are fun if you're teaching a class and you want to show and that you have a bigger uh, deal to do. But one of the and one of the cool people that I met before she died in the pagan movement was a woman named Ellen Cannon Reed. She's a Kabbalistic witch, and she wrote these two books, The Goddess in the Tree and The Witch's Tarot. And not so much the first book, The Witch's Tarot, but The Goddess in the Tree is where we get the idea of how pagans can incorporate Kabbalistic practices without being so tied into, uh, you know, the whole, you know, that whole outer world of you know what the judaic side judeo side uh tends to bring with it then just to find out because we're not going to go over the all the history but what we'll say is that a lot of the uh lodges and things that came along were in the 1500s 1600s all these different times and you get and you got people that came out of it like madame blavatsky uh S.L. McGrath, Mathers, all these people that were the kind of the linchpins about getting things started. And one of the first things that I ever got, one of the first books that I ever got is this, and it's called What You Should Know About the Golden Dawn by Israel Rigardi. Actually, two books that I didn't bring up here because I don't bring them out very much is uh, Garden of Pomegranates and the Middle Pillar. And they're actually, the copies are in pretty good shape. But this here is um, kind of like a little primer of what to expect whenever you're looking into the practices and what the ideas are about. And you got to look at it this way. This man, uh, the only, there's only two people that I've seen that have really, other than the, the greater order itself over time, but Israel Regardi has written more than anybody else. And the only other modern person that I know that, uh, you know, has done, you know, uh, done just as much, but didn't live in that time period as Pat Zalewski. And then we look at some of the places that uh, the Golden Dawn got its, uh, some of its work out of, and that was the Rosicrucian side of things. And uh, it's very fascinating. One of the more, uh, you know, just, there are some things within Rosicrucianism, just within the stuff that isn't directly tied to the Golden Dawn tradition, that if you really take a look at it, there's some of it that will blow your mind. And this is one of the books that I've got recently. Um, this is The Secret Doctrine of the Rosicrucians by Magus Incognito. Uh, this thing is dense. I mean, there is a lot. Um, you know, it, it, it goes deep. And these, this is one of those books that the, the pages aren't, you know, the indentations are not uh, wide. So in other words, you know, some books where you just don't have a lot written. This thing, I've only read half of it. I know what page I'm on because I've got it turned under. But it's like, this is one of those books that you kind of, and I haven't gotten past the page that I'm on because I keep going back and then I'm looking at other things. I'm seeing things online. I'm studying other things, and that's the thing that's cool about studying ceremonial magic, other than the doing, is the idea that there are so many things that so many people have connected the dots with, and, you know, that's one of the things that magic can do, is for people that can't see into the future, that don't know what is going to happen, they want to connect the dots, and with the low magic side and the higher magic side, and that's another thing, okay, looking at it this way. Low magic and high magic. Low magic, like I said, is getting your hands dirty, getting down in the ground and working with it. The high magic is stuff that you're working through the mind, the universe, 
and, and, and things that go beyond the gods even for those of us that are in the, in the pagan and, you know, that kind of mindset. So there's stuff that goes even further and above that. But the one thing about it is, is whenever you're looking at it as a, a fresh perspective, it's, you know, everybody's like, what do I do first? Just start going slow, looking into the things and parts of it that interest you. And then you'll go a little bit deeper and you'll go a little bit deeper and you'll go a little bit deeper and, you know, don't let anybody rush you. Um, if somebody is trying to get you to go to meetings or something like that, find out what you want to find out a little bit before you rush off with a group, because sometimes there have been groups that I've heard that weren't so great, even with an OTO and Golden Dawn and stuff like that. And it kind of freaked the people out. And so it's like, you've got to be careful. So this is something, if you really want to get the effect out of it, you've got to do the leg work before you jump into it. Like the idea of some of the practices that we're going to talk about once we get through this as an example, one of them is just being able to meditate because when you can meditate, you can open up your mind and other parts of your you know, spiritual body to things that whenever you're working with magic that need to be done. Uh, not just meditation, but creative visualization. That's one of the biggest aspects of, of you know, ceremonial magic that people should, you know, flex the muscle as much as they can. In other words, you see all these pretty pictures, but the one thing you need to do is be able to visualize that within your own mind and take yourself and put yourself into it. In other words, you know, like whenever you're doing the pentagram ritual and you're doing the pentagrams in circle and stuff like that, you're not just doing it and, you know, making the motions when you're saying, okay, I invoke the earth and you have to know where to start, where to finish, but you're envisioning that before you, you're doing these things around you, above you, below you, you're creating your spiritual universe. So before you get into that part, you have to be able to, you know, like think of the number one, seeing an image of the number one, working to be able to hold that image in your mind. That's important before you even do any of this other stuff. You know, that stuff is nice. That's great when you can get to it. But for those of us that, you know, aren't, you know, uh, as, as well versed as the, the teachers and the writers and stuff like that, you start with the easy stuff. And this isn't necessarily Golden Dawn, but he was part of the Golden Dawn. And I'm also one of those people that I don't demonize Crowley for uh, Thelema. I mean, the man was a nutter for his own things. But when you look at a lot of the stuff that goes beyond it, when you look at the Equinox and you look at some of these other things that has come out of him and stuff, it's like you can put the man and his, you know, personality and all these other traits off to the side but whenever you look at and he came out of the golden dawn he came out of the aa so it's like it's not like he wasn't versed in it but this is uh conks on packs um it has some really cool stuff my favorite thing in this is the wake world it's just one of the coolest things in it. and there's several different uh uh deals written written in it um and these things, like I say, these books can be pretty much found anywhere uh, at your local store and stuff like that. Another book that I've only gotten recently, this is called The Book of, book of Secrets, Esoteric Orders and Holy Orders, Luminaries and Seers, uh, Dynamo, uh, Dynamics and Rituals, and the Key Concepts of the Occult Sciences Through the Ages and Around the World by Danielle Pineda. And a lot of these books also, um, I used to be an occult book reviewer for Red Will Wiser, and this is published by Red Will Wiser. So a lot of this stuff I've had, you know, as uh, keeper copies, but it's like, you know, this one is kind of a little bit of a how-to book, um, talks about certain uh, ceremonial symbolisms, uh, the secret chiefs, different things. It's kind of like a uh, 
dictionary, just a little bit with the other things added into it. And at the beginning, before everybody started showing up, I was talking about the idea of, well, also we, we think of the hermetic sciences. We think of Hermes, the thrice great, the, the emerald tablets and all these different things. Well, one of the things that came out, you know, whenever hermetic thought was starting to get really big, uh, you not just in, you know, the 1400s, 1500s, stuff like that, but in the modern world that we live in, this is the first book I ever got. And this is the Kybalion of Hermetic Philosophy by three initiates, three initiates. And this was where I was talking about the idea of returning to the all. That is in here. The idea of polarity, the idea of, you know, plus and minus, all these different things, as above, so below. That whole kind of thing gets its uh, uh, germination, if you will, from here. All right, let me take a drink. It is very hot tonight. I think my apartment's almost 90 in here. Another thing that is kind of not necessarily connected to uh, uh, full-on Golden Dawn, but is in its own way uh, beyond just what normal witchcraft and various pagan magical traditions would be, is the idea of working with magical seals, creating them, how to use them. And I got this book given to me in 1990, Secrets of Magical Seals by Anna Riva. Actually, somebody gave me a box one time of the Anna Riva oils and they hadn't gone bad. They, you know, because they're so old, every time you go to someplace that sells any Anna Riva products, the Anna Riva stuff has been around since the 70s. So you're lucky to get any kind of fresh product from their offices or whatever. And I got 10 oils that actually hadn't gone rancid or bad, but, and I've used this for certain things too. Um, if you're wanting to look into that, also another book that I recommend, and you can get it anywhere and everywhere, is the Key of Solomon the King, the Lamegaton of the Goetia. That's a good place to start. You may not be able to work with anything right away, but it can give you ideas and it can, it can give you, that's the one thing, everything that I'm telling you tonight is not stuff for you to like just do right now, but it's things that are going to knead it together and bring ideas into your mind so that you know how you want to start. Because I've seen in so many of these groups, that's another thing that makes me feel kind of bad as you see in some of the, the, the Golden Dawn Hermetic groups on Facebook, you have people that are crack bang new to this. And they go in there, and the very first thing they ever say is, can somebody help me, uh, you know, figure out how to do this? Can you tell me a book? Can you tell me about somebody that knows this? And I've seen so many of them go, well, you don't need to know about that. It's like they're putting them down for their spiritual choice. And I like your pillars in the back, by the way. I see your uh, the pil pillars behind you. Did you make those? Uh, I need to get... I need to get the stuff to make mine. There's a there's there is a book called Teachings of the uh, Inner Teachings of the Secrets of the Golden Dawn, and basically it shows you how to make that stuff, how to make all of the thing. The only thing is making the the fire wand, and the, I might be able to make the cup, but some of that stuff I don't have the woodworking or metal working tools to do it. And there are kits to do it, but I don't want to do it from a kit. So I'm going to wuss out eventually and probably uh, get a hold of an order that makes tools and, you know, puts them out there. The, the Cicero's themselves, when they're not writing books and going around doing it, I think they both make ritual tools and they sell them. But at least they're making it. Somebody there that's making them for people that, are, that can be a part of the order for them to get. But so this is a book. This is going to be hard to find. Um, Yep, carpenter by trade. That's a good thing to have, man. All right, so the next book, and it's kind of sad the man passed away this year, but this is something that isn't necessarily tied to um, Golden Dawn, but it there is a lot to learn here, and this is mono, mo, blah, blah, Modern Magic, 11 Lessons in the magic, High Magical Arts, and this is by Donald Michael Craig. And there's also modern sex magic. 
Uh, he was very much into Tantra and sex, ma sex magic. This book right here cost me a dollar. Got it at a yard sale. And it's like, there are a lot of things here. There are a lot of, the one thing that I like is he tells you how to make the tools here also as well. Like, here's an example. I can get it to show. There we go. That right there is the fire wand. And it looks fairly simple, but whenever you're really looking at the dimensions and things like that, you know, it is kind of an exacting deal. I'm one of those people that if I have a magical tool, I'm not going to have something that's so crappily made because then it, it, it's kind of like it goes against the idea of what you're doing for the ritual. An example of that also is the idea whenever God said that he was going to flood the earth, he told them, I want you to build the ark a certain way down to the exact measurements. Um, and then he says, once you get done, then you go and get the animals and all that stuff, which we know the story. But he just didn't say, build it how you want to. If he told them how to build it how you want to, it would have never gotten done and they all would have been flooded out. But this is a very, 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 very important book. Um, uh, also, another book that's just kind of, uh, uh, how would I say it? pivotal in certain areas and i've got it put up i haven't brought it out it's a book called ladder of lights by william gray okay and then what i'm thinking about doing is we have the golden dawn study group group on facebook which if you're out there i highly welcome you guys to come along sean recently came along and we're starting a good excuse me starting to get a good little number but for anybody that can when people tell you like the idea that only a witch can initiate a witch it's the same way in in ceremonial traditions yes you can travel and you can go and you can take the grade uh rituals with an order whether it's in st louis or if you go to one of the lodges in california that's all well and good but the idea that you can't do it by yourself is a crock of crap for one thing, because, you know, this book's been out for a while. And one thing that I've done is I've, I've skimmed this whole thing. I haven't uh, tried to work through the grades because there's a lot to work to this, even with the grades and stuff. That's why another thing is like this book right here. I haven't even really started to get into it because there's things that we need to do to prepare ourselves to, to understand what this is, like I was talking about with meditation and some other things, which I've got next to me right here, that will kind of, you know, bring it all into to focus. But this right here, I got this, I don't know, about five or six months ago. And this is something, this is one of the first things that I recommend that you can get. Another one is uh, the Black Book, The Complete Golden Dawn System of Ritual Magic. And that was written by uh, Rigardi. And I used to have the black cover, but now they've got hard bounds. They've got new editions of it. And I think Sean's got it. And I see that he probably, yes, that's it, the black cover. And that book can be had for $30 on the low end. And I've seen ripoff artists try to sell it for $300. do not pay $300 for that book. Not, not one little bit. But this right here was like $40, so that was actually a good deal. So you've, you've gotten this little bit of an idea of, you know, that, that you know, high magic is useful for us. Um, it, it's something that, that is like the fortifier of our spirits and, the, and our, you know, our legacy because we have an energy. I call it our legacy. Everything that follows our physical body all of that stuff that we've done for people, you know, on the good side and on the bad side, you know, we have that following us. what our legacy follows us. And that is an energy unto itself. But it's like, you know, we have that side that we haven't never worked with. And that's another thing about people is they get scared of high magic to go, oh my gosh, uh, what if I do something? Is it going to set somebody's house on fire three towns over? Anything magical, regardless of whether it's pagan or high magic or whatever, or solitary or however you're doing it, prepare yourself. 
learn about what you're doing. If you don't think that you can handle it, don't do it. Wait, try it for another time. Because, you know, if you have that little bit of doubt, that's the one thing it says, loose lips sinks magic. That's what they say to know, to will, to dare, to keep silent, to, to know, to know what you're doing, to will, to have the wherewithal to do it in the first place, to dare is to now that you have the wherewithal to do it, to get out there and to do it. And then after all is said and done, don't be braggadocious about it. Keep it to yourself, except for the people that know the situation and stuff. That's fine. But just trying to be grandiose with it and putting it out there, um, you kind of want to, you, you don't want to do that because the universe looks at you and goes, well, that's, that's kind of crap. Why are you being that way? And all this spiritual work that you've done, um, it's like, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a uh, fallback. You know what I mean? Um, so we have that. Now, so the practices, as an example, one of the next biggest things that I think is important and people don't realize, it. okay, so we talked about the tarot. You have the ideas for your tarot decks. There are other types of divination that you can do. And in further episodes, we'll talk about that and stuff. But so, okay, you've learned that the tarot is an important part of high magic in its various instances too. Now you have to look at the timing for things, the way that you do it. And one of the biggest ways to follow all of that stuff is the seasons of the earth and things like that. But also working with the astrological, and this is one of my favorite books, the George's Eight New A to Z Horoscope and uh, and uh, Maker and Delineator. This won't help you do a whole chart. There's a couple other things that you have to do to be able to do a chart. But even not just the idea of doing charts, but the idea of looking at the ceremony, at, at, at a ritual, okay? And you've known whether it's uh, uh, the LBRP or the, uh, you know, the star ritual or the star ruby or whatever. There are things that if you really look at the overall language and writing, it's there's things that are astrologically written within it that give you clues about why the ritual is this way. There will be things that are astrological that are mentioned, such as the constellations, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, Ursa, the Ursa Major, or these things, the Dog Star, and all these different things, because there's stuff that it's not, high magic tends to not just think about the things that we ha are, have here, the heavenly bodies. That's why you have the idea of the archangels um, that are used in certain uh, ritual things. Is because of the fact that it, like I say, it goes back to that monotheistic, beyond the Judaic type of thing. But this here is something not just for high magic. I believe everybody should uh, be conscious about uh, things astrologically. Um, I think also to a degree, low magic can help the high magic. As an example, let's say that you want to study a certain thing about the uh, Kabbalistic uh, tree of life, but you have some questions. One thing you can do is do the numerology for it. Ask the question, should I do this? Go through the numerological, numerological steps. And if you have any type of background with numerology, another thing is you've also got to think the tree of life itself is numerology from the 10 Sephiroth, the paths that tie the Sephiroth, the uh, every single one of the, the tarot cards that are associated with them, those are a number, including the 22 major arcana and all these other things. And then you look at the planetary uh, associations of everything from the first Sephiroth to the, to the 10th. They have planetary things that are tied to them. So this right here is very, very, very important. Um, and there's places you can start. There are groups on stuff. I'm sure if you, any of you come into our Golden Dawn group and you have a question, Sean or me or anybody that has kind of a grasp on what you want to know, 
we can actually I put a couple things in here recently about some astrological stuff. I think it was actually last week. So there's some stuff that I put there uh, recently. Now this here, what I'm going to put up next is not necessarily uh, required for it. But one thing I think that allows us to uh, practice a little bit more successfully is the idea of being able to go out of our bodies. And one of the ways that you can do that is not just through the meditative aspects, but also through the idea of astral projection. And astral projection has its uses because, for example, if you've ever heard of Edgar Casey, Edgar Casey has this concept called the Akashic Records. And the Akashic Records hold every piece of information that has ever been, ever will be, and is ever going on right now. And it's expanding. The Akashic Records are always getting bigger. But we have the ability to, through various journeying of various meditations and various ritual ways, have the ability to go to the Akashic Records and go, okay, I need to figure this out. You go up, you open that sp specific spot, and it allows you to learn. Because that's another thing. We're not, one of the main things that people, you know, they tend to think, okay, we're going to shoot fire out of our fingertips. Their eyes are going to glow blue. If that happens to you, I'm not saying that'll never happen because I'm one of those people believe that believes magic Trump science, except for whenever you're in the hospital and you need a doctor to sew you back up and science me back to life, please. But it's like, whenever you're looking at on a magical, uh, viewpoint let's put it that way it's like these are some important things because if you can't visualize if you can't get yourself in just breathing the the idea of yoga i'm not perfect i know a couple of poses the rest of the stuff i will fall over like a giant elephant but i'm learning i'm a heavier guy i'm trying to lose weight but i do want because yoga is very important one of the uh uh, ceremonial orders that I highly um, not venerate but give them props is the Order of the Temple of Astarte run by writer Carol Pokemon Runyon. Okay, and he's one of the people that in one of his video presentations came upon the idea of not just the fact that, okay, we look at the uh, tree of life in a certain way and that's just the way it is. Uh, there were writers that made uh, attributions of, okay, you just deal with the way that the tarot is, is, is explained, how the, the paths and the Sephiroth are, and that's basically what you got. But Pope came up along the idea of also, because of the fact that he had been into yoga for a while because of health problems that he had been dealing with, he saw that the idea of Kundalini and the chakras and how the chakras align themselves on the middle pillar and, and, and stuff. So that whole idea of uh, the, 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 the Kundalini, the sacred serpent, the sacred serpent is, is almost exactly like the flashing sword that you see on uh, the tree of life. Not exact, but close. They are relatable. They are related. So there's a lot of stuff like that. So it's like, then you have the idea of not just the idea of, you know, having that, uh, that, that Western Indian influence into it, but also the fact that there are, you know, that he's done this within, you know, ceremonies themselves is the idea of the Tatwa system, which are different cards that have uh, different shapes, color from yellow boxes or uh, blue boxes, yellow half moons and all this stuff, and they, each tatwa is a different thing. And what tatra can, tatwas can do is whenever you do path workings, one of the things that we'll, as we get into further uh, episodes, one of the things that we do, that we can do is what's called path workings on the tree of life, because you have the sephiroth, and you have those connecting sinews, those muscles that make it a whole, and those things that interconnect, those are the pathways. And you can go from the first Sephiroth 
to the second to the third and all this stuff. And that's what you kind of want to do. You're taking yourself from this, the, you know, this higher world. And it's, that's what it is. When you start at the top, you're starting at a higher conscience. And when you work your way all the way down to that, we are the, I believe we are the 10th Sephiroth. We're all of it. But when you really look at it, where it starts with the first and you go through everything and you see how the paths connect, when you get down to the 10th, we are the 10th Sephiroth. And that's why we go through that working. That's what we're bringing that down into us. We're bringing us the ability to work with not just in the Golden Dawn system, but work within, you know, Boda and OTO and all these different things is because and goetic magic and stuff like that is the idea that it's it's something that is we're adding it, we're it's we're adding to our soul. I believe that we can build like karma wise our you know our background and all that as we go through each incarnation when you work with these things and i believe that it's like kind of like a destined type thing is because a lot of people just don't go out one day and go well i'm just going to start studying ceremonial magic there's a reason for it and i think there's things that we may have seen or we may have heard or we may even have felt that brings us into this that's why i'm a druid and it's another thing. Don't let people tell you that you cannot work within multiple, multiple fields, as it were, of occult, occult study. That's what occult means. Hidden knowledge, the hidden, the secret, that which can't be seen. That's what occult is. So if you are a Buddhist, druid, ceremonialist, which you can do that. You can do all of that stuff because some of that stuff, if you really look at it and take some of the things that are for your inner self and then the witchcraft and druidry and the other things that you can do that help the people that are around you, it's all synergistic. And people don't realize that. Well, they think, you know, that pagans, uh, pagans are only going to dance around fires and get muddy and dirty and ceremonial magicians are going to stand in uh, rooms with giant golden braziers full of incense, wearing purple robes and all this stuff. And we do do that. We do do a lot of that, what I've just said. But it's not, it's, we're not the stereotype. And there are, one of the best places I think for people to start to is if you can't afford to get books and things like that, because with COVID and all this stuff, people have lost jobs and different things. So there are resources. If you're watching me here on Zoom, there are resources that are out there. You have the Hermetic, the Hermetic Order of Golden Dawn, their actual website. You have the OTO's website. You have Bota's website. You have just about every major, uh, every major magical order has their websites. And the thing that's good about checking them out is most of them at the top will have a section called resources and library. Some of them will tell you what books that you can get either from them or go find around the web and others will have pdfs and others will have essays and stuff that's why you find a lot of stuff by pat zaluski and some of these other writers and stuff christopher hyatt and another thing is for those of us that are in the dualistic realm of being druids and working in uh you know ceremonial magic one of the most esteemed people within the thing I, it's just like his writing style just kind of grates on my nerves a little bit, but the man's a genius is John Michael Greer. And any of his writings on ceremonial magic, whether it's his stuff for uh, the Golden Dawn itself, but also uh, the, the Book of Merlin that he wrote, which is a, a book of ceremonial rituals for druids and stuff. And then the one that I'm, I haven't gotten yet, but I'm hoping it kind of ties into that stuff that I was talking about earlier is the Celtic Golden Dawn, because I'm wanting to see where Greer ties in to what Hyatt's been, or not that, that uh, not Hyatt, that uh, Yates had been talking about before, uh, you know, he, you know, went on, because I'm one of those people, I follow, the, my tradition of Druidry is a uh, Irish Celtic um, pantheistic, Okay, so the difference between what I do and what Obad does, Obad tends to be 
more philosophically and spiritually druidic, which we're all spiritual, but they are in a different realm. They are pagan, but they're not as pagan as what, like, say, ADF and Red Branch Druids and BDO and some other groups do. So you have the heart, more hardcore pagan side of Druidry, and you have the philosophical side. And if you really look at it, there were elements of the Obod way back in the day before Philip Cargom took over, and it was ran by the original chosen chief of the Obod, which was Ross Nichols. And Ross Nichols was uh, uh, Druid Church of England, the Church of England, the Druid Order of England. Um, a little bit, he had a lot of ceremonial le meanings, leanings, but uh, the Book of Druidry by Ross Nichols, it's a gold cover book. It has a lot of stuff in it, but also he had stuff that kind of tied into the Celtic Cold E Church. And once he passed and he ended up passing the reins on to Cargom, which now Cargom does not run Obod. It's a lady and I can't think of her name. She's nice. And she does tea with Druids. He has a, a pod, uh, like a little podcast that he does every so often on Facebook and on, on the Obod channel. And he has her and she is the new chosen chief of Obod. Matter of fact, Cargom is one of those people that believes that you can mix things. And the idea that he came up with a tradition called, tradition called Druidcraft, which is the mixture of Druidry and witchcraft. And it's like, if you really look at it, if you peel the layers away and you go back to early society, yes, uh, even, in, even in the Irish side of things. Okay, you have the Druids that were the ones that, uh, you know, kind of gave the, told the chiefs what to do, where to go, how to get the wars going right, and all this stuff. They were advisors and things. So you have that upper echelon cast of the tribe that that particular uh, uh, leader had, okay? But then you have the people that were under him. So it's not just like the place is just swarming with druids. You also had witches. They were called midwives. They took care of the women. They took care of the, the children that would see demons in their heads at night. They were the ones that, you know, that would, uh, along with the seeresses and stuff, they would come into a person's home when they were, when they were getting ready to pass to the other world, and they would speak into their ears and tell them, it's okay, be prepared. You're about to go to Tirnanog. They would talk you through your death. They would welcome you into the other worlds. And that's some pretty high magic there. When you start working with the, the necromantic type of things, and I'm not talking about raising zombies from the dead, I'm talking about necromancy, working with this world and the other world. That's high magic too. That's another thing that is kind of tied into, uh, it's, it's not a direct correlation, but there are certain rituals within the Golden Dawn, certain rituals that are a generalized form of Western ceremonial magic that can tie into this stuff. And uh, it's, it's not something that you just do every day. There are prescribed times and things like that. But it's like, as you're doing this, it's like you grow. And one thing that I recommend, I'm sure Sean's probably got it and, and other people that have worked with him, keep a notebook. This, like for high magic, I, I think everybody should keep a notebook for every type of magical practice. And I'm not talking about your grimoire. I'm not talking about the book that you just write your rituals in. I'm talking about some kind of little hardbound thing, lined or unlined, that you can make for only taking notes on everything about things that you're studying, questions that you have. Let's say that you, that you try to, uh, there you go, ritual diary. Um, uh, it's the idea of, you know, you can learn from your mistakes. So you write stuff down. Uh, people are afraid of doing the LBRP, which is the lesser banning ritual of the pentagram. They're afraid to do it. It's like, well, I don't know if anybody has ever had a heart attack from doing the LBRP, but, you know, okay. So just, just do it in your mind. You don't have to go through it, you know, literally. Think it through. That's what you do when you talk yourself through uh, a, a car repair or like, you know, Sean might be doing something woodworking and have a little sticking point and he might have to look up something in a manual or a woodworking book or whatever. 
don't be afraid to take notes and kind of look about it because one thing which I think is very important is to look at the times, look at the astrological correspondences, and most important, the outcomes. Because even doing something, you know, and, and learning when to do stuff, like do I have to do the LBRP for everything? For the LBRP, I'm going to put it this way. For most ritual, ceremonial within, within um, uh, certain golden, con golden dawn constructs and things like that, you're going to do it a lot. So if you're going to be doing that particular ritual action a lot, then it begs to differ that you know you want to practice it. Practice it by itself. It is a ritual unto itself. The lesser banishing, it's not the lesser banishing part of a bigger ritual. And it says that it's its own ritual. And that's the other thing is you have to look at the idea uh, of, you know, when you're working ceremonial magic and golden dawn tradition and whatever by yourself is everything interlocks. And then when you're done, that's when you can look at everything as a whole and you look at everything like the, 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 the ritual, of the hexagram, the, the star ruby, and all these other you know, ritual actions. Once you get done, the whole thing's over with, and you come into the next portion of the night and you derobed and you're kind of thinking over, that's when you want to have that book handy and you want to start writing it. Um, and then one thing is like, there's a couple of people that I'm looking for. One is a guy that I've known for like 20 years. And he's supposed to be on Facebook and I emailed him and he actually messaged me back and he says, well, I've got some work I'm doing and stuff. Um, I will uh, give you my Facebook name because on Facebook, you can put a different name on there. You can lie. It's like, they aren't, you know, he says, but I'll give you that information. And the reason why is because he has been in several different orders and he's somebody that I respect for one. And another thing is like, if you're sensitive, as another thing, gosh, there's so much. Working with the energy, energy side of things. Hello. I see your wife. Hello. Oh, that's so sweet. Good to have Sean here. This is his second time being here. I really appreciate it. And I told him here in the future, um, I've done interviews with other people that eventually I want to do an interview about him as a druid and working with the ceremonial magic. So here, possibly sometime down the line within the next month or so, we might see about getting together if, you know, your time affords it and stuff like that. And I appreciate Sean being here tonight. We're almost done with this, actually, but uh, there's a couple other things um, that I kind of wanted to talk about before we kind of end it is I've had people that have said, you know, that have been discouraging about it. And they, you know, that, that, and it's not just people that have been Christian that because you know, you're always going to have the Christians that are going to say, uh, don't do it, you're going to go to hell. That just makes me want to do it more. I don't know about you, but when somebody tells you not to do something, I tend to float the opposite direction and do it. But at the basics, is to start looking for the information. Look for what you want to find out about. Um, there are some names that I kind of tend to gravitate to as looking at, you know, because of these people have had a lot of influence on um, ceremonial magic in general. H.P. Bablatsky, S.L. McGregor Mathers, Israel Regardi, Alistair Crowley, Christopher Hyatt, Christopher Hyatt, William Gray, John Michael Greer, Pat Zalewski, Chick and, Sabra, Chick and Sandra Tabitha Cicero, and there's, there's just a bunch more. But those names, specifically Israel Regardi, S.L. McGregor Mathers, and Blavatsky, because that's when you're looking at the earlier foundational history of what brought the golden dawn together and you know instead of doing it the opposite way around i could have gone more in the idea of looking at the oto side of things but there are certain deals that, and yes there is a hermetic order of the of the uh Thelemic golden dawn 
which is basically a, a Crowley-esque version of the Golden Dawn, just, you know, that. But you kind of looking at the OTO because there are merits to OTO and there's a lot of merits to the Golden Dawn, but I stick with the Golden Dawn because there's these little nuggets of things that whenever you really look at what Rigardi talked about and that the way there, there were essays that were written, there were, uh, there were articles and things that uh, talking to Blavatsky, she was like, she was a genius and she just kind of sat back and watched everything, you know, but whenever she did speak, I mean, Blavatsky had a lot of influence within the Golden Dawn. Mathers, um, listen for the name of anything with uh, uh, you know, hermetic, hermeticism, period. There is, hermeticism covers so many things, not just Golden Dawn tradition, but a bunch more, I mean, which we will eventually get into. Um, so take the time to look into that stuff. And one of the things that's just the easiest, it's not, it's not the easiest, but one place to start if you are going to go into the Kabbalistic stuff off the bat is to find you an image of the uh, Tree of Life. And the good ones I like are the ones that incorporate not just the tree itself, but the pillars and Ain, Ain Sof and Ain Sof Or, which is the realms above the first Sephiroth like that yes and there's one that's like that that i want to get that is a tapestry it's like 10 times that size and that's going to go in my temple but that right there and you start at the beginning you start at the top you don't start with number 10 you don't start with yourself you're trying to work with yourself so you do start with yourself you're always you're you, you know they say working the paths from the first to the 10th because we are the 10th sephiroth that's true and you can go anywhere. You can study whatever part. But when you really look at it, when you see that higher self, which is above what we are, that grounding in our very root, our very root of our soul that ties us to the universe is the tenth Sephiroth. So when we start with the first and we work our way through the supernal triangle and we move through the other triangles and we look at the formation of the, uh, the uh, sword of light, and things like that it's like it's like making it's like building a bridge across a, a river that you've never been able to get you've never been able to get across and taking these little bits um it's just it's it's important learn to breathe breathing you wouldn't think about it but you know breathing there's a lot of kundalini type things and that's when you work that energy that comes from our lower selves that shoot, just shoots out if you do it right. Working with energy is important because if you ever do become part of a, uh, an order or a group or a lodge or whatever, one thing is everybody that's together in that ritual, they're adding their energy to what's going on. And if you're the low man on the totem pole, that doesn't really know how to work with energy. You can be that that uh, ground when you put the ground wire on on your car, and it shorts everything out because you weren't the one that was you weren't charged up. You didn't have yourself in the right spot. So that's another thing, and that's another deal is the idea of like I'm trying to lose weight. I'm trying to be more health conscious because magic, when it's people that are sick, sickly. And all these different things, if you're not exact, not, you don't have to be 100% healthy like a triathlete and stuff. But the better shape you are, the better conduit, conduit you are of any kind of magical energy, whether it's pagan, low magic, or high magic. But whenever you're working the LBRP, whenever you're doing the visualizations of the pentagrams, when you see the pentagrams flaming before you, when you're charged up, you can see the pentagrams flaming before you. And above you, as above, so below, as within, so without. And that's another thing you kind of have to take, not just the ideas of what the ritual is, but looking at the, um, the spiritual concepts, because high magic is not just about ritual. As an example, looking at the, uh, the, the uh, artwork for the, for the Tree of Life, you have three pillars. You have the pillar of, uh, of uh, 
you have the middle pillar, you have the pillar of severity and the pillar of mercy. Those are actual concepts that deal with us, you know, that, you know, mercy and, uh, you know, there's each one of the, the Sephiroth have their own, like, um, oh, what would I call it? It's not the first one. It's, it's the, I think it's the second one, second one, Bina. And my pronunciations of some of these things are as horrible, but there's one that is like the, one of the words that you watch word for it is worth. It can be a monetary worth. It can be a spiritual worth. It can be how much you feel and esteem how much you're worth uh, to yourself, to others and things like that. So when you take each one of those key words that are associated with the concepts that come through, and there are concepts that are on the paths too, all of the paths, then there are concepts that are locked within the tarot. So and it's like, but the one thing is like, even if you're not going to do any of the ritual actions, one thing that you can do is like talk, take that ritual diary that Sean's talking about and write down and note those actions and those things that tie together with those one word. And then you're going to have these wor three little words that kind of tie these all together for each Sephiroth and each path. And then when you get done with it, it's going to be time consuming, but hey, we're we're magicians, we're pagans, we love this stuff. I don't know very many of, of you know, even ladies I've known that just, well, I've gotten this, I've known women within the, the Golden Dawn that's just like, you want to see my library and their whole house is ceremony magic books and things that are related. I'm going, your husband doesn't mind, does he? And she goes, nope, he takes me to go get these, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So it's like, and what I want to do with the next, time that we get together and i might do this next week it might be another week after that but we're going to start talking about how to get into it in the beginning some of the practices some of the visualizations um, and some of the symbols so i'm probably going to learn how to do the shared screen on this because i'm not that you know that savvy with a lot of this and i'm going to bring up some of the symbols and things that you might see a lot of stuff that Sean's probably got there with him that are related to various ceremonial practices, various, various ceremonial orders, such as the Rosy Cross, such as the uh, triangle and the cross that was uh, on the cover of the Golden Dawn Ceremonial Magic Tarot right there. Yep. There are things that those mean, that there are, there are meanings and symbolizations behind those. So we're going to kind of go through that and um, kind of help you guys kind of learn, uh, you know, how to do some of these visualizations and things like that. And I might even stand up and demonstrate the LBRP. It's, it's not that hard. It can be depending on you and your proclivities and how proficient you are magically. It could take a few minutes, but what I'm doing is like showing you and yes, there are there are some great uh, demonstrations on YouTube, but I think you know this is something that we can show for people. Um, and it's it's not daunting. It's not overly. Now the greater banishing ritual, which yes, there is a greater banishing ritual, is a little bit different. Um, and some of that. And then uh, towards the end of that, we'll kind of get down the line. And one of the things it's going to get a whole episode to itself, a talk to itself. Is we're going to talk about Goetia, we're going to talk about Solomon, and we're going to talk about uh, some of the actions that are kind of linked in with Goetic magic, um, the angelic things and stuff like that, how that all comes together, and uh, making it as easy and as, you know, compacted as I can. Because like I say, I talk pretty much down at street level. I don't come at you with big words and stuff like that. And I bring it out as, as much as I know. That's why in the future, we're going to have Sean do an interview with me. And I'm going to post that on YouTube because I want to get his insights into a lot of this stuff because Sean's been involved in this for many years now. He's a druid and he's involved with you know various aspects. So I think he has a little bit of a understanding about the things I'm talking about and can give you guys some ideas about what it really takes to do some of these things, 
the dedication that it can take. But, you know, it's like, it's not just the idea that it's a dedication that you have to do this stuff. It's the results. If there wasn't something that we didn't gain, not just a gaining thing in like a material sense, but if it wasn't something that didn't add to us, that didn't register in our minds and say, you know, this is something we ought to be doing as much as possible, we wouldn't do it. That's why if I've been pagan now, I've been a priest. Oh, let's see. I was initiated in my first coven in 1991. This is now 2021. I've been a Druid priest since 1999. I, that's when I had uh, first got hooked up with the Henja Keltria. Henja Keltria was going through some trouble. So in 2000, I formed the Order of Standing Oak. And recently, I formed a, a Saxon group here called the Raven Temple of Wicca, which is based on Raymond Buckland's book, The Tree, a book of Saxon witchcraft, the original from 1974. So I'm a multi-layered individual as well. Sean is multi-layered too. He has druidry and he has these other things in his background. And there are as many people that are involved in ceremonial practices that go way farther out than the two of us. And you know what makes that so cool is if you ever run into those people and you have a conversation and you, know, and you think there might be a question that they might have an answer for or an idea or a thought about something, don't be afraid to ask because that's going to give you that's going to give you the ability to have a, a, a greater understanding as you move forward. You want as much information as you can get, and you get it from as many people as you can. So if I find Sean knows something and he puts it in the Golden Dawn group on Facebook, which is Golden Dawn Study Group, and it shows a picture of the uh, self-initiation into the Golden Dawn book. I invite you guys to come on and come in there because I'm usually posting about two, three times a week at least. And eventually for our area, Sean is in a different part of the country, but for those which there's like 10 or 12 that are actually from this town that I'm in that are in that group. Once we can get past some of the quandaries of COVID, I'm wanting to do some actual get together study group. And what I want to do with that is kind of have somebody here to do transcripts and I want to put that out to you guys so that we can transcript and give you guys the ability to see, you know, what a, a study group is, you know, how we come together and how we figure out what it is that we're going to learn before we even think of touching, you know, that curriculum for the, the solitary, you know, the self-initiation and things like that, such as, you know, how, how are we at meditation? How are we at visualization? How are we at understanding because for some people, everything I've said tonight has gone over their head and under their feet, which is fine. Everybody's comprehension is different. But for those that have a little bit, just have the idea that these things will stick in your mind, it's good because, you know, I'm going to be 55 this coming year and I'm moving forward in life. And I think the more that I work within this realm as a pagan and as somebody that's working in a ceremonial track, that I'm going to feel a lot better about things whenever I move into the next life. Because, you know, in this, I'm going to die and we're going to go on to the next thing. But I think building myself, building my uh, soul, building all of that as a druid, because it's going to the other world and different things. It's like, it's all interconnected. And uh, that's why I'm putting this out there because one of the things I'm a cancer, cancers tend to be in the priestly side of things. We tend to be religious. We tend to be spiritual. And so that's why I've been, you know, involved in this for 30 years and whatever. But it's like, I'm not selfish about it. That's why I've got several different groups on Facebook. I've got the YouTube channel. I've got interviews that I've done with uh, people such as Raymond Buckland. I've done interviews with Kasur Sarath, um, Selena Fox and stuff, because these are people within our communities. What I'm trying to do, once the man's able to calm down and life isn't, you know, so rough for him, is I want to interview Juan Milo Duquette. Um, he does a daily thing where he reads through some of his books. Um, he has been doing some seminars lately, some paid seminars, which I wish I could afford, but I can't. But if you can't go to uh, the daily or his seminars daily. Sometimes he misses because, you know, life comes up and he has to do stuff. 
But Lon Milo Duquette on Facebook, he's live. He talks about Goetic Magic, talks about his many, many books. And as far as uh, one of the things that I like is he's big on tarot. Of course, that's the tarot that, that Sean has. But also, um, he's done some video series. And one of my two favorites is uh, The Great Work, the series that he did on The Great Work, which I have every, every put it this way, every Lon Milo Duquette video, I have it. And I have it on this computer that I'm talking to you on. I have the disc, but I've said, I don't want to have to go get the disc every five minutes. So I just load it onto the drive. But the great work. And then there was um, a, a video that he's done strictly on Goetic Magic in his home, which was just incredible. And then another one, I can't think of the name of it, which I'll have to uh, put post in the liner notes because this is going to go on, on YouTube. Um, there was a video that he did on the idea of everything that you look at the symbolism on a tarot card, specifically that deck that I showed you, that's the universal weight deck. That's a writer weight deck. And writer weight is kind of like the standard. There's hundreds of thousands, but whenever you think of tarot, the writer weights are what you think. And then you have the Bota deck and you have Lawn's deck and you have all these others because they have different things that go with it. But there's symbolisms that are in here that are tied to Hebrew concepts, uh, the, the Hebrew letters and all these things. And he takes all of that and breaks it down like how certain levels and tiers of the tarot cards go in certain levels and tiers of each of the Sephiroth. And it's like an hour and a half video. And it's good because he talks to you um, in a very um, earthy, you know, down to earth style. And there's a book that he uh, recently did. It's called The Chicken Kabbalah. It's funny. He likes to be humorous. And I bet Sean has it. I love you, brother. He's going to go straight to his thing. And he has it. He has a copy. Oh, he has, uh, well, what's the two that he's got there? He's, I know he's got the chicken Kabbalah. Yeah, the chicken, oh, and son of, okay, okay, all right. Yeah, because I didn't, I forgot that he had written a uh, sequel to it, but yeah. So, and he's got some books on Goetic Magic. He's actually been writing since the late 70s. So when you look up the name Long Milo Duquette, you're going to find a lot of stuff. Oh, and um, one book that I highly recommend for everybody because it, it's like a catch-all for everything that can kind of give you ideas about some of the things that you're going to study, and that is The Magician's Companion, put out by Llewellyn Books, written by Bill Whitcomb, and it's about that thick. It's probably about as thick as the Golden Dawn book, and it's not Golden Dawn focused, but there are things within this that are tied to it. And it's like that must have in your library, which I have over there. It's in my stuff. So this is just a little get together. I just wanted to get people together that have had, you know, what is this about? Where can I start? What are some of the books that, and I don't have everything. Good God. If I had everything, my apartment would be full to the ceiling and I wouldn't be able to sleep in my bed. There's just that much out there. And it's another thing. Everybody will tell you this and I'll tell you too. Don't take my word on any of these books that I've told you. Look it up. Look into it yourself. And if you see something that kind of doesn't jive, don't mess with it. Because all you're going to do is make yourself wonder why you're doing it. As an example, for Druidry, the two books that I do not recommend the most is The Sacred Cauldron by Tag McCrossin. I just don't. There's just something about that book I don't like. And of course, the 21 Lessons of Merlin. Because the dude who wrote it is a misogynist and a tax dodger, and he's on the run. So, and it's just like, you know, you know stuff that is a little bit more legit, and you know bullshit. And unfortunately to me, the, and I've had people that have, you know, that have kind of argued with me on the McCrossin book, but nobody has argued with me on the 21 Lessons of Merlin. It's just, it doesn't fit. And there are going to be certain books within uh, the uh, ceremonial magic world 
that don't fit. So if it doesn't fit, don't use it. But another thing before we shut this down, one place that I recommend the most, because you're going to find about 150 to 200 different things that you can probably get the full books on uh, for the OTO style, Bota, Golden Dawn. It's called the Internet Sacred Text Archives. It's huge. I've been looking through that thing for 30 years, and I'm not even close to being done with it. You know, and that's just that's just skimming to read everything in the Internet Sacred Text Archives because you have pagan sacred texts, you have Indian sacred texts, you have Vedic, you have Nordic, you have all this stuff, and then you have the ceremonial side. But if you look at the 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 archives itself, it tends to be more lean towards volume wise in the ceremonial magic. I mean, there's going to be two or three hundred things, and that's not just books. You're going to find essays and connections to collections because there are certain ceremonial writers that have stuff that are put in certain libraries and things like that that we may not actually have access to so that we're only going to get to see snippets and essays and dissertations of some of these things but it's like you look for everything you look for every little nugget because if it helps to turn that light bulb on and what we're going to do um, I think it's important to get all the sources that you can. So I'm going to take another little drink. I hope everybody's had a great night. I want to thank Rhythm Bar Farms. I want to thank Pam. And I want to thank people that are listening out there. If you're muted and I can't see you in the list, thank you guys. And we'll probably... If the holidays and things don't come up too hard and getting ready for sound and stuff, we might try to do this again for this discussion here in a couple of weeks. I've got some other things going on, but Sean will see it because I will post it in, in the Golden Dawn group and some other stuff. And Sean might see some of my stuff because we're friends on Facebook. But, you know, so we're, we're not going to like cram all this together because I've got other things that are coming up. But I just want to take this time and, you know, give everybody some things to think about as far as you know uh getting together and you know just learning a little bit just taking the time to sit you know say this is where i stand with my thoughts about ceremony magic and like i said there were some things that i disagreed with within it and things and realms like i've said i want to go in the more druidic celtic some of the ways that john michael greer has written about and what i'm wanting to find with yates because once you can reconcile those things together, it, it, just, it just makes more sense. So I want to say good night, Sean. Thanks for coming and hanging out. Pam, be safe. Be careful. Rhythm Bar Farms, I appreciate you and everybody else that's on here. I'm going to go ahead and shut this off, and I will see you guys around. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs>